What's up, everyone? My name is Tyler. You are watching Mom's Basement MMA. Welcome to my UFC 306 preview and prediction show. We are going to preview and predict every single fight that will be taking place on UFC 306. Before we get into that, please smash the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. We recently blew past 7,000 subscribers on YouTube, and we've done all of this in roughly... Uh, nine months, and that's been pretty crazy. This channel has grown exponentially since we started doing preview and prediction shows. Thank you so much for tuning in week over week and being an active participant in our community. I appreciate all the love. I appreciate all the support. Without further ado, let's get into the fights. And today is September 5th. I'm not going to be publishing this video for a few more days yet. So keep in mind, the bout orders are 100% going to change and the odds will as well. So we're going to do everything based off of the date of the recording. And we're going to start with Raul Rosas Jr. going up against Arichi Lang. This will not be the very first fight of this card. I have a hard time imagining these two are going to fight before Hawirgi and Souza. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, we'll take that with a grain of salt uh, or Shy Resin Van. I'm almost positive these two are going to fight before Rosas Jr. But in any event, guys, let's go into it. Raul Rosas Jr., minus 670, and then the comeback on Richie Lang is plus 500. Now, it's surreal to me that Rosas is still just a kid. He's a teenager, and he's already been in the promotion six since... 2022 when he fought uh jay perrin but that was back on contender no he fought mando gutierrez on contender and then he fought jay perrin in his ufc debut so he's been in the promotion for as long as he has and he's still a kid he's still only 19 years old but i believe that's a testament to the ufc being very smart about who they pair him up against they don't want a repeat of edmund shabazi and i think they learned their lesson there uh and if you've been watching mma for uh longer than that uh go back to Sh sage northcutt a guy that was uh, doing really well, had a lot of success. And then, you know, he started going up against competition. Uh, that was a lot more difficult. And then he ended up kind of washing out of the promotion. Edmund Shabazi, and he hasn't been looking all that hot uh, as of late either. And they definitely don't want to repeat those sins with Raul Rosas Jr. So that's why they're giving him the matchups that they have been. And he's been looking pretty good, 9-1. and one. The only blemish on his record is against Christian Rodriguez. He looked good initially in that first round, but then... He exposed he had some shortcomings with the cardio in that particular fight but since then he's looked okay he fought terrence mitchell who is a jobber but uh he made quick work of him like he was supposed to and then most recently he went up against ricky tercios he was a uh, pretty big favorite in that one minus 225 but i think we all went back to this fight against c-rod and that's kind of what tampered or that's what kind of tapered down the odds in this bout if you will at least that's my theory anyway there were a lot of people that were uh nervous about his cardio about his health going into that fight against tercios when they were supposed to fight the first time in mexico city i was uh really concerned about that fight because we saw him gas and i know mexico city is a high elevation low uh area and I, I had some trepidation about putting down a large sum of money on Rosas going into that fight against Tercios initially. That fight didn't, of course, end up panning out. They end up fighting stateside. I was a little bit more comfortable betting on Raul Rosas Jr. in that uh, in, in the rebooking because I was like, okay, he's had a little bit more time. We're not fighting in elevation. I'm a little bit more comfortable laying down a wager on him. So I went ahead. I did that. And uh, he looked pretty good in that fight. He was effective on the takedowns. He went four for seven, and he locked up. And then he racked up five minutes and 49 seconds of control time. So uh, good for him. He hands Ricky Tercios the first submission defeat of his career. But I don't think a lot of people were too surprised. I mean, like I said before, they're very intentional about their matchups with this kid. They're going to put him up against opponents they feel he can beat at this stage of his career. So... We'll see if that ends up being the case with the Mongolian murderer, his opponent, Arichi Lang. He has a 3-3-1 record. All three of his wins have come, against, have come against opposition that has all washed out of the UFC. Uh, but what is surprising is lately he has won three out of his last four. That sounds cool, but of course the big asterisk with Arichi Lang is that fight against Daniel Marcos. For all intents and purposes, this was a fight that he was getting his ass whipped in, and he was well 
on his way toward losing. Very fortunate there that that fight ended up being a no contest because it was not competitive whatsoever. Daniel Marcos was really going to town on a Richie Long. I took a flyer on a Richie Long too. I, uh, I, I had some doubts about uh, Marcos going into that fight and that ended up uh, being uh, a pretty silly thing, a pretty silly take on my part because Daniel Marcos was just teeing off on this guy and I'm lucky that it ended up being a no contest. Otherwise, that one would have cost me uh, some bank. Uh, as far as this fight outcome is concerned, guys, I think the pick here is got to be Raul Rosas Jr. I think he can figure an early sub against Arichi Long. I'm going to say it happens in the first round. Uh, Arichi Long, he does have 58% takedown defense. Uh, Tercios had 45%. Jay Perrin had 58%. C-Rod had 65%. And we remember that he was able to... Uh, take down C-Rod initially and look good initially, but the Mongolian murderer, he does not have anywhere near the grappling chops of C-Rod. I'm not very concerned about uh, Arichi Long's grappling. I think Robo Rosas Jr. is going to have a distinctive edge there. It would be a massive, massive upset if Arichi Long uh, can get this one done. I think in order for him to win this fight, he is going to have to, number one, first and foremost, uh, figure out a way to stuff the takedowns, but he's going to have to catch Raul Rosas Jr. making a mistake. He's going to have to uppercut him. He's going to have to knee him when he goes for a uh, takedown, something to that extent. Anything's possible in MMA, and Arichi Long, he does have the striking chops to do that, but I am 100% going to be taking Raul Rosas Jr. here by by early submission. I think uh, this for sure is uh, one of the anchors of a potential parlay here. Um, I just don't see a world in which Raul, Raul, Raul Rosas Jr. doesn't get this one done. Probably a parlay candidate for most people going into this contest. Okay, we move on to the next fight. Egra Shirez, he'll be going up against Joshua Van. Now, this was supposed to be a different opponent. Uh, Egra Shirez was supposed to fight Kevin Borjas. Borjas ends up dropping out, and now we have Joshua Van taking this fight on short notice. Edgar Shirez, I feel, is a guy that the jury is still somewhat out on. He has five losses, and everyone he's lost to, whether they are in the UFC or not, they are all solid. So while you look at that loss column and, you know, five losses, that ain't, you know, his record isn't the most flattering, we'll say, but the competition does check out for the most part. Um, the most recent loss was against Tatsuro Taira, and we all know how good he has looked lately. He will be fighting Brandon Royval later on uh, in a few months, so that's a loss that's aged quite well for him. He uh, There was that fight, that no contest fight against Daniel Lacerda that he was winning, but then he ended up running it back with da Daniel Lacerda. He ends up uh, tapping him out on that Mexico card not that long ago. Then there is Joshua Van. Joshua Van, this is a guy that's looked spectacular um, going in, in his tenure in the UFC thus far. He has his debut fight against Zalgiz Zhumagulov. He wins that one by split decision. He beats Kevin Borjas, and then he beats Felipe Buniz before suffering his first defeat, and that was against Charles Johnson. Initially, he was winning this fight, in my opinion. Uh, some people may feel a little bit differently. I know Charles Johnson has already gone on record saying that prior to the knockout, he felt that he was winning every round. Uh, I disagree with him on that one. I thought Joshua Van was winning that fight prior to getting knocked out. Dropping a fight against Charles Johnson, I don't think that's the worst thing for this kid's career, quite honestly. Charles Johnson, he has 100% turned his career around, and he's looking every bit the making of a flyweight contender on the precipice of getting a number next to his name. So I think we'll see big things coming from Charles Johnson really soon. He's completely turned his uh, UFC tenure around. He was a guy that I thought was going to get cut uh, pretty recently, but he hasn't, and he's looked good. So I'm bringing all that up because suffering a defeat against Charles Johnson, I don't think that's a bad thing, especially for a kid who's only 22 years old. I like Joshua Van in this fight. I think he's a dynamic striker. I think Edgar Shirez, he needs to get this fight down to the ground. I think he needs to use his grappling. He needs to use his jiu-jitsu. He does have some uh, pretty good guillotines. He does have an array of submissions to his name, and I think that is what Edgar Shirez needs to do in order to get a victory over Joshua Van. I don't see that happening, though. I like Joshua Van's uh, striking in this one. Um, I'm not going to say KO, TKO or KO, though. I'm going to say it goes the uh, distance. We are taking a little bit of a gamble because this is a short-notice fight for Joshua Van, but 
I do believe he will get this one done. Currently, he is a plus 135 underdog going into this fight against Shirez. Um, This fight is not available on my book right now, but as soon as uh, I can bank a wager on this fight, I absolutely will take Joshua Van at dog money. I hope that holds up. It would not surprise me in the least bit if uh, the line flips here. Uh, as we get closer to fight night, I mean, Joshua Van has looked uh, very, very impressive up until suffering that defeat against Charles Johnson. Um, so I'll be going with him uh, by decision. I like his striking a little bit more in this one. I think if he can keep this fight on the feet, he'll do just fine. Van by decision will be the pick for me. We move on to the strawweight division where Yasmin Hawirgi will be going up against Ketlin Souza. Hawirgi minus 440 and then Souza is plus 340. How Weirgi is three and one in the UFC. Her only loss was against Denise Gomez at UFC 290. That was probably a fight she should have won in retrospect. And uh, I've been off of her lately since she dropped that fight. You may recall uh, I went on Sam Hughes against How Weirgi. How uh, Sam Hughes was a plus 425 dog going into that fight, and I thought to myself, Sam Hughes. She has ruined plans before. How Weirgi disappointed. I'm going to take a flyer on her and see if she can uh, pull off the upset against Yasmin. And of course, that did not end up being the case whatsoever. I thought How Weirgi cruised to an easy 30 27 decision in that fight against Sam Hughes. She dominated that fight from the opening bell to the closing bell. A very, very impressive win for Yasmin How Weirgi. She proved me wrong. Uh, but I wasn't completely off base against Sam Hughes. She ended up pulling off the upset in the fight following uh, the Hawirgi fight, but uh, that'll be a story for another day. So good job, Yasmin Hawirgi. She's still only 25 years old, and you go up uh, at this age, at this young of an age against a veteran like Sam Hughes. I know Sam Hughes is a uh, fighter that's kind of like on the fringe of being in the UFC or not, but she can surprise people, and we just saw her do that most recently. So I think that's a really good win for her. She has an 11-1 record. She'll be going up against Ketlin Souza. Souza is a newcomer to the UFC. No real notable wins in her career to date. She has a brief stint in Invicta FC. She does have wins over two journeyman fighters that I recognize from her resume. She did make her UFC debut against Karine Silva, and she got knee barred, but it is Karine Silva. I'll give her a pass on that one. That's a uh, tough fight for her to have to... Uh, uh, take on in her UFC debut. So I'm not going to give her any grief for losing against Silva. Silva is a uh, very, very serious contender. I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing big things from her in her UFC career. In her most recent fight, she was a big favorite over Marnik Mann. She was a minus 380 favorite. I was shocked the odds were only had her at minus 380. I was thinking to myself that uh, she was probably going to be like a minus 500 favorite going into that fight. That ended up not being the case. I put a couple units on her and she looked really good. Uh, a clear 30-27 decision for Souza. Not really a whole lot more I can say about that fight. Uh, as far as this contest between Hawirgi and Souza, Souza at uh, plus 350. I mean, that's incredible value there. I think you will definitely get rewarded if you have the gambling appetite for Souza if that one hits. I mean, those are crazy odds. Um, I'm actually going to back Hawirgi in this one. I, I will take the favorite. I'll say she gets this one done by decision. She's been... Um, pretty impressive. I like her finishing power. Um, we've seen that before in Combate Global, and then she did put away Estela Nunez. I'm not sure if she's going to be able to do that against Ketlin Souza or not. I will say this, though. Uh, I don't like this number for Yasmin Hawirgi. So this is going to be a fight, guys, that I am just going to avoid altogether. She is not going to be in a parlay for me. I'm not actually all that confident in it. She's been slightly more impressive to me. Souza, her previous competition, there, there's a big question mark there. We see a, a, a victory against a journeyman fighter there. Uh, another victory against Christina Williams, who is also a journeyman. And then Marnik Mann, who's probably a fringe UFC fighter. So her uh, loss against Karine Silva, probably not the most surprising. Yasmin Hawirgi is a cut above. All of these fighters, with the exception of Silva, of course. I just like her. I think she's a little bit more battle-tested. I will I will take Hawirgi by decision, but this is going to be a fight that I'm going to avoid altogether as far as gambling is concerned. All right, guys, let's move on up the card. Our next fight is going to be contested at lightweight, where Manuel Torres will be going up against Ignacio Bahamondes. The fight odds on this one are about as close as it gets. Manuel Torres, plus 105. Ignacio Bahamondes, minus 125. 
We're already seeing a little bit of variance here from when I last looked up the odds to how they're reflected on Tapology. You are seeing a little bit of a difference there. The lines are probably going to be very, very tight up until fight night. We have basically a pick'em situation on our hands. We'll start with Torres. He's 15 and two. He's a Mexican fighter who made it through on contender by beating Colton England not that long ago. And this guy's just been on an absolute killing spree. He has yet to see a second round in the octagon, which is a uh, crazy stat. He's only been to two decision once in his pro career, which is a very impressive stat. And that's why he's been favored to the extent that he has been in a lot of his previous fights. In his most recent contest, he went up against Chris Duncan. He was a minus 190 favorite in that fight. Barely broke a sweat in this one. He gets an early takedown, gets Duncan's back, taps him immediately. His finishing rate is absolutely absurd. Um, something to keep in mind. I want to say, with the exception of that one fight that went the distance, he wins pretty much every single one of his bouts by uh, by finish. So uh, a crazy stat line to consider for Manuel Torres. He'll be going up against Ignacio Bajamundes, who's 15-5. and five. He has a 4-2 and two overall record in the UFC. His losses have been against John Macdessey. He lost that fight by split decision. And then he also lost the fight against Ludovic Klein last year. He has some bumps in the road, but overall, it's easy to see why so many people like this dude. He's tall, he's rangy, he's got slick striking, and he can also finish fights too. Uh, like Torres, definitely Ignacio Bajamondes is 100% a fight finisher. He has 11 uh, fights that he has won by finish previously. In his most recent fight, he was a minus 310 betting favorite against Christos Yagos. We all know kind of what the score was for that one. Yagos, probably in the twilight of his career, he was on a one and three st stretch and um, he had been finished in nearly every single one of his fights. So he needed a Hail Mary in order to win this one against Bahamondes. And Bahamondes at minus 310, I mean, essentially that was free money uh, and that played out exactly how you uh, thought it would. So uh, Baja Mondes was probably the anchor of most parlays in his most recent contest. And really, truly, this is going to be a 50-50 fight. Uh, it's it's hard to see who's going to have the distinctive edge off the feet in this contest. Uh, Ignacio Baja Mondes off the feet. He does look very, very slick. Uh, he's also very, very powerful. Um, for this one, guys, I'm actually going to go with Manuel Torres. Um, I like his grappling a little bit more than Ignacio Bajamondes, and I do like that power quite a bit. Um, I understand it's a bit of a difference in terms of uh, overall competition, but I like the uh, finishes here. I like the power. I do like the fact that uh, he went up and chose to grapple Chris Duncan and win the fight that way. Um, I don't know if Ignacio Bajamondes has the grappling chops as somebody like Manuel Torres. In fact, I'm anticipating Manuel Torres to approach Ignacio Bajamondes very, very similarly to Chris Duncan. Chris Duncan can crack. He can knock you out. And Manuel Torres, he was like, well, I'm, why would I get in a firefight with this guy? I'm just going to take him down to the ground. I'm going to uh, choke him out. And that's how I see this fight going down. I like Torres in this one. I'm going to take him by uh, early-ish finish, we'll say. I think grappling is going to be a big part of his game plan. I don't know if he's going to be willing to uh, stand and trade for a prolonged amount of time against Ignacio Bajamondes. People will laugh at me. People will call me an idiot for saying that because this guy can absolutely crack in his own right. But um, Torres at dog money, guys, I'm not going to pass that up whatsoever. He's every bit as dangerous, if not more so, than Ignacio Bajamondes. And I do think he has the grappling edge over Ignacio in this fight. I'm going to pick him by second round submission in this one. And I like this number. I like the plus money. For Manuel Torres, this guy looks every bit of killer. I'm going to roll the dice on him to get this one done by second round submission. Okay, next up, a fight at bantamweight where Irene Aldana will be going up against Norma Dumont. Very, very tight fight as far as the odds are concerned. Minus 120 for Aldana and then plus 100 for Dumont. At least that's when I last checked. Tapology has slightly different odds than this. Most people uh, like the Brazilian in this fight, 54% of the Tapology community going with the Brazilian to get this one done. Irene Aldana, you know, the, the UFC bantamweight division is uh, something else because essentially if you are an active 135-er, uh, you're basically ranked. Chelsea Chandler, for context, is the 15th ranked contender and she's 6-3 and three with a 2-2 two and two record in the UFC. Uh, Jermaine Durandamy was gone for four years and lost to Norma Dumont and she's the 14th ranked contender. And I'm saying all this because 
you're never really too far removed from title contention in this division, especially if there's an injury or a visa problem. You never know, and it's not without the realm of possibility that one of these two girls uh, with a win here could find themselves in that uh, title picture. Like I said, it doesn't take a lot to get considered for a title contention because um, you have Pennington, you have Kayla Harrison, and then you have Loudmouth, Pena, right? So, like, outside of those three girls, if something were to happen to one of them or if if if, if there's an injury, a visa problem, whatever, they're probably going to go back to the well and grab uh, somebody like an Aldania, somebody like a Dumont to um, uh, get a title fight. You never know. It's certainly within the realm of possibility. Uh, but in any event, let's uh, shift back over to Irene Aldania. She went up against Carol Hosa in her last fight. She was a minus-185 favorite in that one. She ends up getting the win. It was a 29-28 decision nod for her. It was a good fight, good striking by both fighters. This was a fight that Aldania got low-kicked 100 times in, though, uh, and that is actually not an exaggeration. Go on UFC stats, and you will see that uh, Carol Hosa just absolutely teed off on Irene Aldania um, with those low kicks. She was very, very effective. You thought Anthony Smith couldn't check a low kick. Holy shit. Go back, look at this fight. Uh and you will see, like, Hosa was able to land those at will against Irene Aldania. We'll see if that ends up being a factor in this uh, contest against Norma Dumont. Norma Dumont went up against Jermaine Durandamy in her most recent fight. It was a minus 105 pick em sort of situation. Uh, I ended up going with J Jermaine Durandamy in that fight. Um, it closed as a pick em, but I want to say I picked uh, Durandamy at an underdog, and of course, that didn't end up uh, panning out for me. This was a clear 29-28 in Dumont's favor, in my opinion. Uh, Dumont getting 6 for 8 on the takedowns and keeping control time for most of the fight paid off. That's what got her the win here in uh, that contest against Jerain Durandamy. So good job, Norma Dumont. We can see that she is on a bit of a tear lately. Uh, that win against GDR that we talked about prior to that, she beat Chelsea Chandler. That was the fight that Chelsea Chandler ran away from. Uh, she beat Carol Hosa as well, and then uh, went over Danielle Wolf, who I don't even remember her. So uh, all in all, she's looked pretty good. The last time she lost the fight was against Macy Chasson. Irene Adanya gets the nod over Carol Hosa, and then before that, she loses to the Lioness. Uh, has a win over Macy Chasson and a win over Yanta, Yana Santos. So um, we'll see kind of what happens with this fight. Uh, Aldania is 36 years old, but she's still looking uh, pretty good. She is fighting at a very high level still. Uh, as far as this contest is concerned, guys, I am going to go with Norma Dumont. I, I think the takedowns on the grappling are going to make the difference here. And while it's true, Aldania has 76% takedown defense, when was the last time it was put to the test? I'm willing to gamble that Dumont can get this fight down to the ground and keep it there. That's why I'm going to go with her to get the decision nod over the Mexican fighter. All right, next up, a fight at flyweight. This one is on the main card, surprisingly. Ronaldo Rodriguez going up against Ode Osborne. Very, very interesting fight to have on the main card. I'm going to say that again. UFC 306, you would have thought that there would be uh, maybe something else uh, that they would do. Like, I'm kind of surprised that Aldania versus Dumont wouldn't be uh, on the main card, or um, even the, uh, the Rosas Jr. Uh, fight to be on the uh, main card instead of this one. But... Um, in any event, that's just kind of, uh, the way that they decided to, uh, stack this one. And, uh, I got a controversial take. Uh, well, maybe it's not controversial. It, maybe it's just me being an asshole, but listen, guys, the name of the event is called, uh, Riyadh Noche. Okay. Like they're fighting in the sphere in Vegas. There's going to be a shitload of Mexicans in the stands. Who do you think the UFC wants to win in this fight? It's as simple as that. Like, Ronaldo Rodriguez, like, they want this kid to win. They picked a very winnable op opponent for him to beat prototypical Bellator matchmaking in this fight. Like, that's exactly what they have. They want Rodriguez to win, and they picked O'Day Osborne to job for him. Not too difficult to connect the dots there. Ronaldo Rodriguez, not to say plans don't get foiled. We saw Kyle Nelson win on uh, uh, the last Noche card, but, like, the UFC designed this fight for Ronaldo Rodriguez. And we see Ode Osborne, uh, he's only one out of his last four. He got that split decision victory against Charles Johnson. Some people thought that one went the other way. He got knocked out against Tyson Nam. He got finished by Asu Almubayev. And then most recently, he uh, got 
submitted against Jafel Filio. So um, not looking too good for uh, Ode Osborne as of late. Ernesto Rodriguez, he is a 16-2 and two fighter. He's only 25 years old. The last time he lost the bout, you have to go all the way back to Dana White Contender Series in 2020 when he um, dropped, fell short against Jerome Rivera. He went back to the regionals. He fought in Jorge Masvidal's now defunct MMA promotion that was called Icon. He goes back to Mexico and he fights in their promotion uh, called Lux Fight League. That is like one of the more notable uh, Mexican MMA promotions. And he did quite well for himself. He comes back to the UFC. He fought uh, Dennis Bondar in his most recent fight. He was a minus 120 favorite in that one. I went with him as the slight betting favorite. He ends up choking out Bondar in round number two, but Bondar definitely had some moment, moments in that fight. I remember he smashed Rodriguez with a spinning elbow that Rodriguez just ate. Uh, Bondar was also finding success with the takedowns too. He got uh, uh, four for six on the uh, takedowns against uh, Ronaldo Rodriguez, which was uh, impressive. The fight was actually pretty close until Rodriguez ends up getting the rear naked choke. Um, so good for him. That was a uh, solid win over a pretty good veteran. Uh, Dennis Bondar, kind of a shame that he's no longer with the promotion. I don't think he's like that bad, but uh, Ronaldo Rodriguez uh, got the job done there. And then prior to that, uh, we saw that he was going up against, you know, so-so competition. Um, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. That's not exactly fair. A 5-1 and one guy, that's okay. 5-0, and oh, that's good. 5-1, and one, good. An 11-11, you know, that's probably, you know, whatever. Angel Rodriguez probably wasn't the primary opponent. I'm sure someone else got hurt or whatever, and they had to, like, sub in this guy on, like, last uh, as a last-minute replacement. That's complete conjecture on my part. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But sometimes with the regional MMA uh, scene, you don't get the most compelling matchups, and you just kind of have to fight whoever they can uh, uh, throw in front of you. Uh, so good for him for winning that one by stoppage. And then Ode Osborne, we already went through his track record. I stupidly went with him uh, in that fight against Jeffiel Filio. I thought that uh, his takedown defense would hold up, and I was, like, hilariously wrong because Filio, like, went for a takedown. I think he only, like, went for one takedown. Like, the takedown he went for, he got on Osborne without any major difficulty whatsoever, and he was able to uh, almost immediately uh, get a fight um, uh, get the fight won by submission. So I, uh, can't help but think that, that we're going to see a similar result here. Uh, I'm going to say just because Ronaldo Rodriguez is a little bit on the younger side, it did take him, um, a little bit of time to get the submission against Dennis Bondar from what I recollect. Uh, I don't remember what round he ended up finishing this fight against uh, Bondar in. I want to say it was like the second round, but I could be wrong. I might need to be fat checked, but uh, I can't help but think he's going to figure out a way to submit Ode Osborne here. We see him getting finished a lot, and he's been finished uh, by submission in his two most recent fights. Now, I know Ronaldo Rodriguez, probably not the submission threat as these sort of fighters, but he does have some decent uh, grappling chops. I also think he's going to benefit having uh, Shorty Torres in his corner for this one. I think Shorty Torres is a phenomenal person to have on your in your corner. Uh, he does train a little bit out of Extreme Couture MMA. Of course, that's where Shorty is. And uh, I you can look for uh, probably him and Eric to uh, be in the corner for Ron Ronaldo Rodriguez in this fight. So uh, Rodriguez looks uh, to be very impressive. I'm going to bank on him to get this one done. Uh, by submission, I don't think Ode Osborne is going to really uh, be a match for Rodriguez if these two end up grappling, and I'm expecting that to be a big part of the game plan here. I'm expecting Rodriguez to want to try to take this fight down to the ground and do what a lot of other people have had uh, success doing, which is finishing uh, Osborne off, off of the ground. 64% of people on Tapology are picking Rodriguez to get this one done by submission, so there you go. And, um, yeah, minus 165, I will uh, throw a unit on Ronaldo Rodriguez to get this one done in this contest. All right, we move on to the lightweight division where Daniel Zellhuber will be going up against Esteban Rebovics. Zellhuber is the minus 225 favorite, and then the comeback on the Argentinian fighter, plus 185. Zellhuber has been doing great for himself as of late. He has a 3-1 and record in the UFC. His one loss was against Trey Ogden. Currently, he's on a three-bout winning streak, over mostly entry-level competition, but he's still only 25 years old, and it's crazy to think that he has already been in the promotion for three years, considering his age. In his most recent fight, he went up against Francisco Prado, and he was the minus 275 favorite in that contest, and we went with Zell Huber. That was a decision that ended up being the right call for us. This was a one-sided beatdown in this fight. 
Prado may have won the first round, but Zell Huber clearly won won rounds two and three and sliced Prado open badly. Prado was a uh, bloody mess in that fight. I thought Zell Huber might finish it late. So full credit to uh, Prado for hanging in there. Prado is a dangerous guy, especially in the beginning of these fights. And he comes from a uh, very good gym and go chat MMA. So I was very impressed with Daniel Zell Huber in that contest against Prado. Esteban Rebovix, he is 13 and 1. He trains out of Killcliffe FC now. The last time he lost a fight, you have to go all the way back against Loic Rajabov. That was back at UFC 285. Like Zell Huber, he's also gone on to look pretty good in the comp- in the promotion, admittedly against lower level opposition, but uh, he's still a young guy in his own right and uh, not too long in the UFC. After the contest against Rajabov, he gets one. Uh, he gets a victory over Camilla Kirk, and then most recently he fought Terence McKinney. This was a fight, guys, where I thought it was a 50-50 fight. Quite honestly, I went with McKinney as a dog. I thought McKinney would use his wrestling, get this fight down to the ground. Terence McKinney got a kill shot almost instantaneously by Rebovix, and it was one of the most horrific knockouts I've seen all year. And that is the sort of fight, guys, where when McKinney comes back, he may not look the same is kind of what I'm getting at. He's all His chin has always been a little bit of a question mark with uh, Terrence, but after getting horrifically knocked out like that, it may be even worse. And uh, I have very grave concerns about Terrence McKinney moving forward in the promotion. In fact, I would go as far as to say I don't need to see Terrence McKinney fight in the UFC anymore. I um, I just have genuine concerns with the, with the safety of that um, for his health as a human being. I don't want him, uh, you know, to get, like, permanent damage. Like, he's got a young son. It's like, dude, like, maybe MMA is not for you. Uh, Esteban Rivovix may have put a fork in Terrence McKinney's career. It was a horrific knockout. Uh, full credit to Rivovix for uh, getting it done. I really like Rebovix. Uh, I was so impressed with that knockout against McKinney. And there is a big temptation on my part to go with him. But the reason why I'm not is because I have issues uh, with Zell Huber's reach in particular. I think that's what's going to ultimately make the difference in this fight. Zell Huber has a 77-inch reach to Rebovix's 69%. Esteban must get inside and unleash hell on Zell Huber, and I'm just not sure... Uh, we're going to see that in this fight. I don't think either of them are really going to look to uh, make this a grappling fight either. I think this is a fight that's going to uh, predominantly stay on the feet. And if it does, uh, I'm going to go with Zell Huber in this one. I think he um, isn't, I don't think he's got the power of Esteban Rubivix, but I definitely like his striking. I like his accuracy. I think he can play the role of the sniper in this one and outpoint uh, Rubivix. Rubivix at um, plus, at near plus 200. From a gambling perspective, guys, if you want to go the other way, I don't hate that because this guy certainly can go lights out. The biggest difference I see here is he doesn't have the name recognition of a Daniel Zellhuber. Um, and the popularity points account for a lot in gambling. I'm, I know I'm stating the obvious. I know a lot of people just rolled their eyes there, but it is true. I think a lot of people just look at uh, name recognition and go off of their bets uh, that way. I don't hate an underdog play on Esteban Rebovix. But like I said, I think that reach for me is what's going to make me uh, end up picking Daniel Zellhuber. Uh, I like him here. Um, we saw uh, him fall short against Trey Ogden, but I'm not seeing that here. I think he can outpoint Esteban Rebovix and uh, look pretty good uh, doing so. I think they put this fight up uh, for a reason. I think it's going to be a very entertaining fight. Esteban Rivovix getting a knockout finish wouldn't be the most surprising outcome to me, but guys, I'm going to go with the Mexican fighter to get it done on points. Uh, Bazooka versus Sniper Rifle. Pick your pick your poison, I guess. Um, you can definitely see a pathway to victory for either guy. Like I said, I really thought about going with Rebovix in this one, but I would want him at, a, at, at better odds than plus 185 if I'm going to pull the trigger on something like that. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to take Zell Huber by decision, but minus 210, minus 225, I think that's way too high for me. Uh, guys, this is going to be a fight that I'm just going to sit out. I have way too much respect for Esteban Rebovix. I have way too much respect for that man's power. I am not going to get trapped uh, on this fight. I'm not going to uh, get trapped by Daniel Zell Huber potentially getting knocked out. Like I said, I don't think it's going to happen. My prediction is going to be Daniel Zell Huber, but I don't like these odds. So this is going to be a fight, guys, that I'm just going to avoid. Let's move on to the featherweight division where Brian Ortega will be going up against Diego Lopez. 
this is an interesting one, and I'm curious that we would see Brian Ortega fight at featherweight again. That goes against the narrative that we had been hearing as of late. The rumor was he was going to go up to lightweight, and he wasn't going to compete at featherweight anymore. But as of today, and today is September 5th, this fight is booked on Tapology at 145 pounds. So let's see if that ends up being the case or not. I have yet to hear any news to the contrary. So my expectation is this fight will be contested at 145 pounds. These two were supposed to fight earlier this year, but of course, at the last minute, Brian Ortega ended up dropping off because of some health concerns. And um, and then, of course, Dan Ige ended up uh, taking that fight on only a few hours' notice to fight Diego Lopez. So Brian Ortega plus 150, and then Lopez is around minus 180. This will be Brian Ortega's second fight of 2024. He's been out. He had been out for about a year and a half after getting hurt against Yair Rodriguez. So they run that one back in February of 2024. And what unfolded in that contest was a fight that I'm still trying to make sense of. In that fight against Yair, in the pre-fight introduction, he ended up rolling his ankle. And in the uh, very first round, Yair bloodied Ortega and hurt him badly. And you got the sense that the ending was approaching. Ortega ended up surviving Good for him. The second round, he forces the grappling and busts up Yair with uh, a lot of ground strikes. In the second round, after the second round, I had a tied fight going into the third, and then we start seeing Ortega find more success with the grappling yet again, and Ortega eventually ends up arm triangling his opponent and getting a pretty big upset. Um, I thought Yair Rodriguez was going to beat the hell out of Brian Ortega. I believe those are my words exactly. And I felt that Yair let a very winnable fight slip through his fingertips there. I was uh, very surprised that uh, he did not end up getting the job done there and didn't end up uh, knocking out Brian Ortega. I thought that knockout was very, very near in that contest, and it just didn't end up happening. So for Brian Ortega, that ended up snapping a two-fight losing streak officially. Um, there was that freak incident where he ended up getting hurt immediately against Yair. And then before that, there was that epic fight against Alexander Volkanovsky. Uh, that was one of my favorite featherweight fights of all time. Um, he nearly ended up getting him, uh, getting Alexander Volkanovsky out of there with a submission. But of course, that didn't end up happening. And then there's Diego Lopez. Now, um, this guy just continues to push the bar. He has been in the UFC for slightly over a year, and he goes from being a short-notice replacement to fight Movzar Evoliev to now fighting the third-ranked featherweight contender in Brian Ortega. What this man has accomplished in the promotion in such a little amount of time is uh, absolutely spectacular. The UFC loves this guy, so do the fans. And, you, and when you watch him fight, you can understand why uh, he's such a gangster. Um, that fight against Dan Ige, like a lot of people call Dan Ige a legend for taking that fight, and he certainly is, and I'm not trying to take any thunder away from Dan Ige, but you also have to give an equal amount of credit, in my opinion, to Diego Lopez in this fight. He was supposed to fight Brian Ortega. You have a game plan for somebody like Ortega, and Dan Ige is the exact opposite of a Brian Ortega, and for him to have to go through the weight cut, anticipate fighting at 145 pounds initially, and then Brian Ortega said he can't make that. So you have Diego Lopez having to make up lost ground in order to fight Brian Ortega. Ortega ends up dropping off entirely, and then in comes Dan Ige, and then they end up fighting at, I want to say it was like 160 or 165 pounds. I'm not quite sure which one it is. I know it was in the 160 range. So Diego Lopez, like talk about all that uncertainty. Talk about... Um, the amount, the weight cutting that he was initially doing, the game plan for Ortega, and then to fight somebody completely different in Dan Ige, I thought that was equally as impressive. So you really have to give credit to Diego Lopez for taking that fight because had he lost that fight against Dan Ige, this fight likely would not be happening right now. So he went for it all, he risked everything, and he ended up pulling it out uh, against Dan Ige. Um, this was a fight that I thought he ended up winning. Pretty clearly, I think you have to give Dan Ige the third round. We definitely saw Diego Lopez start to fade maybe a little bit. I think that's probably fair to say. But again, because of all those factors, um, I don't think we saw the best performance for Diego Lopez. I think all things considering, um, like I said, the weight cuts, the, ch the, the quite literal last second change in opposition, I think all of those played a factor 
in him maybe not looking as dominant in that Dan Ige fight as he had been against somebody like uh, Sodiq Youssef, who he able who whom he was able to finish in quick order, and then un- he made mincemeat out of Pat Sabatini as well. Um, this is a fight, guys. I like Diego Lopez in this one. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to crack uh, Brian Ortega and finish him that way. Like Brian Ortega, I will say this about him. I've seen this guy take a lot of shots, um, and he just keeps walking forward. Uh, In this fight against Yair Rodriguez, he ended up getting popped a lot, and he kept walking forward um, nonetheless. So I'm really curious to see um, uh, if that, if, if he's going to be able to continue to do so, because he's, uh, he's 33 years old and we've seen him take a shitload of damage over the years. At some point it would like, at some point you would have to think that that chin isn't going to be there anymore. And if he walks right into, uh, one of Diego Lopez's shots, Diego could end up getting a finish that way, but I'm not going to call a finish in this fight. I think Diego Lopez by decision is the right move. That's how I will be picking this fight. Uh, And at minus 180, that's actually not a bad deal, in my opinion. Uh, I will go ahead. I'll put a unit on Diego Lopez to get this one done. Uh, For Brian Ortega, what is his best pass to victory? It's certainly not in striking. He does not have better striking than Diego Lopez. He wants to grapple, but is that really the right approach for somebody like Diego Lopez? I'm not quite sure. Diego Lopez has uh, definitely jiu-jitsu credentials up the ass. We all know uh, his background. We know he is a jiu-jitsu coach for Alexa Grasso and a lot of other people in his gym. Uh, I don't see him getting out grappled by Brian Ortega. I think Brian Ortega, that is his best path to victory. I think this matchup is a stylistic nightmare for somebody like Brian Ortega. Um, I, I will take Diego Lopez to win a comfortable decision victory against Brian Ortega in this fight. Okay, guys, we move on to the co-main event where Alexa Grasso will be going up against Valentina Shevchenko in a rubber match. We all remember in their last outing, it went to a split draw and kind of a 50-50 split on who you thought won that fight. You have half of people thinking Grasso did enough. Half of people thinking Shevchenko did enough. I personally thought Shevchenko won this fight 48-47, but no argument for me. If you have it going the other way, 48-47 for Grasso, I, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, I can I can certainly understand a world in which you would score that fight for uh, Alexa Grasso too. Like I said, very, very close fight. We'll see what ends up happening in this one. Statistically, aside from volume of striking, Valentina has Grasso beat in every other major statistical category. I thought that was very interesting when I went to UFC stats and I started combing through everything. Uh, You have to give Valentina the edge uh, in all of those categories. So we'll see what ends up happening in this fight. Um, There really is no sense in like going like in depth between this one. We see how close these two are. I've been going back and forth on this one, quite honestly. Uh, I I actually kind of like had a lean initially, but now I'm kind of like going the other way. Guys, initially I was going to take Shevchenko in this one, but you know, the more and more I look at it, the more and more I kind of am inclined to think that Alexa Grasso can do enough to uh, pull out a decision in this one. I do think for some reason, and I don't have like a good analytical reason as to why I don't have any evidence. So it's complete conjecture or anecdotal is probably the better word as to why I'm taking Grasso, but uh, Grasso is in the prime of her uh, fighting career right now. And for females like 36, I mean, you know, Valentina Shevchenko, she didn't show that she was like washed up uh, in that fight a year ago against Grasso. It was a hell of a close decision, but you're talking about something that happened almost a year ago. And uh, time is not kind two people when you're in your mid thirties, like Shevchenko is certainly not in her prime anymore. And I think you're going to see that, uh, in this contest. And guys, I think Alexa Grasso, I don't think this fight's going to be as close as what a lot of people might think it will be. I don't think it's going to be as close as the odds indicate that it will be. Uh, Give me the fighter in her prime and the fighter in her prime right now, at least statistically is likely to be Alexa Grasso. I'm going to take her to get it done. Um, I think she can, uh, just fight the more complete fight to Valentina Shevchenko guys. This is not a good breakdown. I don't have like the stats in front of me. I don't have like a compelling case or evidence to support my thesis on why, or my prediction on why I think Alexa Grasso is going to win other than the fact that it's a gut feeling. Um, she's in her prime, she's younger. And, um, I think she can do enough to, uh, pull out the, uh, decision against Valentina Shevchenko. Shevchenko looked good as of late 
we saw her get finished by uh, Alexa Grasso previously uh, in that initial contest that surprised uh, everybody, myself included. Like I said, I thought she did enough to win this fight in the uh, second meeting, but I'm going to go with the and still to get this one done to close out the trilogy. Um, if Alexa Grasso wins this fight, I don't see Valentina Shevchenko uh, coming back. I think that might be it for her. In fact, it might be it for her win or loss. So, guys, I'm gonna go with the uh, the and still. And if I'm gonna get, and if you give me the uh, current reigning champion at minus 115 odds, I will 100% take that. Um, full respect to Valentina Shevchenko. I wouldn't be completely surprised if she ended up pulling this one out. Uh, and getting it done by decision, but I'm going to go with the younger fighter. I'm going to go with uh, Alexa Grasso to retain her title in this fight. Okay, main event time. Uh, we have Sean O'Malley going up against Marab Balashvili. Um, odds are have the odds have this one at a pick 'em fight currently, but I have already put uh, a couple units on uh, this bet previ on this fight previously. Um, when the odds were a little bit different, I'll tell you who I'm picking here in a second, but just know as of right now, it's a pick em fight minus 110 each. Uh, I would expect that the lines are probably going to hold right around here. One of these guys might end up being the slight favorite as we get closer to uh, fight night, but um, I don't expect these odds to fluctuate too, too much between now and then. Sean O'Malley in his most recent fight. He defended his title against Marlon Chito Vera. He was the minus 275 favorite going into that one. And I think most of us laid down a lot of money on Sean O'Malley to defend his title. And if you put the wood on Sean O'Malley, like I did and many others, uh, you were rewarded. This was a masterclass performance, an easy 50-45 all day long. I thought Cheeto got outclassed in this fight. The output between these two was uh, just night and day difference. Sean O'Malley cruised to an easy win against uh, Cheeto Vera uh, in that fight. Not surprised that Sean O'Malley won, but I, I was a little bit surprised, if I'm being honest, a, a, as to how dominant he was in that contest against Cheeto Vera. And now we have Mirab Valashvili finally getting his chance at UFC Gold. Of course, he, has been, he had been the bridesmaid for a very, very long time. Uh, behind Aljamain Sterling. Of course, Aljamain Sterling, his longtime teammate, is no longer in the 135-pound division. He moved up to featherweight, so Mirab Balashvili finally getting his chance at UFC Gold. Lately, he's been on a tear. He has wins over Peter Yan, a win over Jose Aldo, a win over Mar Marlon Moraes, and then a win over Cody Stamen. In his most recent fight, he went up against Henry Cejudo. This was at UFC 298, and I thought it was a uh, straightforward um I thought this was a straightforward uh, decision. 29-28 for Marab is how all three judges and the media had it scored. Um, Marab outstruck Cejudo by a wide margin, managed to take him down five times. Um, Cejudo got one takedown in the fight. I really had um, nothing really further to add in that one. I thought Marab won that fight against Henry Cejudo pretty clearly. As far as predicting this fight, Marab is likely going to come out on full tilt pressure he's going to level change he's going to constantly shoot for takedowns and you can expect a rinse and repeat approach for the full 25 minutes that this fight lasts and we've already seen him uh execute this game plan before against peter yan he attempted 49 takedowns in that uh contest uh so i would expect more of the same from marab balashvili in this fight in my mind because of all of that i think o'malley should be the underdog going into this contest his takedown defense really has not been tested, I feel. Um, you go look at who he's been fighting lately. Uh, Cheeto Vera, he's not a takedown threat. Aljamain Sterling, he is. But, of course, uh, we saw how that fight ended. Peter Yan, a striker. Pedro Munoz, we're not going to talk about that fight. And then Halian Paiva. So, I don't know where Sean O'Malley's takedown defense is. And quite honestly... This fight comes down to, do you think Sean O'Malley's takedown defense is going to hold up, or do you believe in Marab to get this fight down to the canvas and keep the fight there? Marab the machine, like he, like this guy is nonstop. He's not going to gas out. But where is his health at right now? Because today, as of September 5th, there is speculation that Marab Balashvili has a staph infection. There have been photos that circulate. Uh, you look at like a lesion on his arm, 
that 100% looks like staph infection to me. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just going off of what the, what it looks like. And it looks like um, that is something that he might be battling. Now, of course, we know that guys have been inflicted with that before and they've gone on to win. Uh, most recently, Islam did did just that. He confirmed that he had staph infection when he went up against Dustin Poirier. He ended up choking him out. So is that going to be a factor or not? Because uh, ironically enough, Benoit Saint-Denis, he also said that he had staph infection when he fought Dustin Poirier, ironically. And he was winning that fight initially, but then he ended up getting smoked. And then he ended up saying that it had a the antibiotics and what he had gone through uh, training while he uh, had that infliction, that had a big impact in the fight. Is it going to have an impact in this fight or not? I I'm not sure. Um, here's the thing. Rob, with or without staff, doesn't change my opinion on the fight. I'm taking Sean O'Malley in this one. I think Sean O'Malley is going to get a finish in this fight. I think it happens in the championship rounds. I think Sean O'Malley is going to be losing the fight up until that point. I think this fight's going to... Um, be where Marab, I think this fight's going to play out where Marab is going to be up on the scorecards by quite a bit. I think he's going to find success in those takedowns. And O'Malley is going to be behind in the cards. I think, I think O'Malley is going to be spending a lot of his time uh, trying to anti grapple. I think he's going to be spending a lot of his time trying to stand up and uh, keep Marab Balashvili off of him. But eventually, he will fend him off. And eventually, he will have an opportunity, and Sean O'Malley is a lethal striker off the feet. All he needs is one shot against you to put your lights out, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen. I think going into the fourth round, uh, Marab's going to be up in this fight, and Sean O'Malley is eventually going to find a finish here. Um, this is a breakdown that's going to anger and infuriate a lot of people because uh, Sean O'Malley is one of those guys that um, you either love him or you hate him, but... Um, and maybe that, maybe to a lesser extent, that could be true of Marab. They're going to 100% be a contingent of people in the comments section uh, saying that Marab is going to be unstoppable and he's going to get this one done. Well, we'll see about that. I think it's a close fight. Um, I will give Marab his credit. I think he's going to be winning this fight up until he gets knocked out. But me picking Sean O'Malley by knockout, I don't think that's the wildest uh, prediction. That's how I have this one going down. Guys, those are my predictions for UFC 306. I think we went with uh, a lot of chalk in this one. Um, O'Malley's a favorite. Grasso is uh, a favorite. Lopez is a favorite. So is Zell Huber. So is Rodriguez. I only picked a couple uh, dogs. Dumont's a, a dog. Torres is a slight dog. Uh, Van right now is also a slight dog. So we, we went with three dogs in this, in this card. Um, I hate to pick chalk all the time, but I'm not going to pick a dog just for the sake of picking a dog. That's just how I have these fights going down. Um, some people are going to love these picks. Some people are going to hate them. But you know what? What's new? That's every single week. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to my coverage for UFC 306. These are how I have the fights going down. I want to know in the comments section which one of these you think I got wrong, and we'll continue our conversation there. Thank you so much for being a part of the community. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.